Good morning. I'd like to thank Texas Heart Institute for inviting me to speak today, especially like to thank Kathy, Deb, and Ann for inviting me. And it's, it's a pleasure speaking to you today. Um, as you can imagine, the last few years has been a very stressful time for all of us, um, students, CCPs, and also the American Board. We've had to implement many changes to navigate this pandemic, and I'm here to highlight some of the changes that we have made during this period for the students and the CCPs, and hopefully um, tell you a little about where which direction we're going in and some new things that we've been working on for the American Board. One thing I'd like to point out, uh, your title to your, to your meeting today is Honoring the Women and Leading with the Heart. Uh, you'll recognize a few people in this photo on the left. Deb Adams um, is honestly all heart. That's a good way to describe her. Uh, she puts her all into everything. She doesn't judge anybody. She just, that's the way she is. And she's a great person to uh, have as a mentor down there and as a friend to, to everybody. I, you are so lucky to have Deb in your program. It's, it's, I cannot speak enough about her. Um, and on the right, you have Ann Guerco. Everybody recognizes her too. And she's currently the vice president of the American board. And she is a strong, thoughtful and heartfelt leader uh, that will, uh, this also a very good person that you have down there. And we sincerely appreciate her work and endeavors on the American board also. And oh, in the middle here, we have Beth Richmond. She's our executive director on the American board. And uh, she is also the, she's basically the heart and soul of the American board. And she's been with the board since its inception. And I cannot speak enough about her leadership and her dedication to uh, the perfusionists in the country and the certification process in this country. Um, this, she's unbelievably to work, unbelievable to work with and uh, a great role model for us all. I had the honor of visiting Texas Heart a few years ago and doing a site visit for KHEP. And I was amazed by the facilities you have down there, the staff you have down there, and the education, the resources you have at Texas Heart. Uh, during one of my tours, though, I was just awestruck by this headlamp of Denton Cooley. I, I couldn't stop staring at it. And I was just imagining, you know, what this light shone upon and what happened in between the circle of plastic. It's just, uh, it's just amazing to, to be, to, if you, you could just step inside that headlight for a short period of his career. It's just, it's just awesome to just imagine what went on. And it was just very interesting to see part of this little history of Texas heart. So my objectives today are to review the American Board Examination Challenges and Actions during COVID pandemic, to explore the outlook of perfusion educational programs during the pandemic, and to look into the, the impact of the pandemic on the CCPs and review our certification stats. I will also discuss advancements and enhancements of the American Board during this adverse time. So what are some of our coronavirus actions and responses? Well, I must say that 2020 was just the perfect storm and gave us many headaches. Uh, the American Board examinations were initially scheduled for March 25th and through March 28th of 2020. 62 examinees were registered to take the spring examination. And um, as you all know, our exams are administered by Prometric Testing Center. So, at, um, Examinees sign up with Prometric testing centers to sit for our exam, and they can schedule us on their own. Uh, however, on March 16th, I started noting, or be beginning of March, I started noticing on the Prometric websites that a lot of centers are starting to close because of the pandemic. Uh, we were in constant contact with Prometric, and they were saying, no, the majority are open, a few have closed, not to worry about it, and we can adjust the schedule for anybody that is at a closed center. So on, on March 16th, I sp ex expressed my concern to the uh, national office and they said that uh, they contact Prometric themselves and that all Prometric centers were still open. Suddenly, less than 24 hours later, on March 17th, they informed us that all Prometric testing centers were closed. Um, I almost fell off my seat at that time. I was like, we just talked to you yesterday 
and now you're closed today. So uh, we had to scramble and all the examinees were immediately notified and that there could, there'll be no fees to them, no changes to them. We'll try to get their tests in as soon as possible. And also they'll have the option of postponing their test to the fall examination if they prefer. Uh, perform, uh, Prometric informed the American board that on April 19th that the spring examinations will take place on June 17th through the 20th of 2020. So, you know, they kept on working on dates where they felt like uh, the majority of the centers will be open and they can have the exam at the, uh, safely at this time. Again, all examinees were contacted and rescheduled for the June exam or given the option to sit through the exam in the October exam window. So some of the impacts on the clinical rotations. Um, uh, it, so in spring 2020, uh, we were notified that a lot of clinical rotations were closing. Uh, so we were talking about the impact on students and sitting for the exam. We had to temporarily waive the 75 clinical case requirement for graduating students. We basically accept the number of clinical rotation cases as is, and as is completed by March 16th in any accredited perfusion program. So, uh, you know, what we found out is that majority of cases that the students already had their 75 cases. There are a few exceptions where they had like 72, 73, you know, this is pretty close. And we were willing to accept this during the time of crisis. We reviewed any examinees applications and requirements and solved their problems based on a case by case basis. You know, for example, if somebody was missing a case or two, we looked at it and decided, yes, you can sit through the examination. We also stayed ahead of the pandemic too. We received regular updates uh, biweekly, basically, from Prometric regarding the status of testing centers for the fall exam. I were, really wanted to make sure that this doesn't happen again, where the perfect storm happens, and you know, all of a sudden, a day before the exam, exam it closes. So we really try to avoid this and stay in really good contact with uh, Prometric during this period. We monitor the progress of all summer graduates for any hardships in starting a career during a national crisis. For example, if they were to you know, have a state licensor, depending on if they pass the exam, we worked with the state licensor boards to have the students uh, sit for uh, the exam at a later time and also get their licensor, a temporary licensor. So our 2020 results were we administered 461 PBSE and CAPE exams through the Prometric Testing Centers. The fall exams are ministers as scheduled on October 14th through 20, 22nd on 2020. So few, we made it without a glitch. There were like, I think one or two glitches at some centers and a couple examinees were impacted. One of them is rescheduled for a later time. Another one had to go to another center, but that was dependent on the individual center. Um, and a total of 210 examinees earned their CCP in 2020. So congratulations to those of you, if you are one of the 210 of the last year that earned your CCP. Looking ahead now, the 2021 exams are on schedule at, without interruption at this point. The spring exams were administered on March 24th through 27th. 39 examinees took the PBSE exam, 33 passed the exam, 62 examinees took the CAPE exam, and 52 have paid, uh, passed the CAPE exam. The fall exam dates are scheduled right now for October 13th through 16th at Prometric Testing Centers. The American Board is staying ahead and connected with the Profusion Educational Programs. In February, the American Board reached out to all the Profusion Program Directors via the PPDC to stay ahead of the COVID uh, pandemic. And we just wanna be aware of any educational or clinical requirement shortfalls throughout the programs. Uh, only two uh, programs, two programs out of 17 responded that they will fall short uh, on some of their clinical requirements. And this is because some of their clinical rotation sites have closed or held back some of their students and they will not be able to get their 
clinical cases and their pediatric cases in time. However, uh, an update is that both programs expressed that they should meet the requirements. And I just talked to the director of the PPVC programs and he said that there really shouldn't be any problems with this year's graduation since we are in late May already. So uh, there was talk about one program may move graduation back a month or June, but we have not heard anything else from this program. So it looks like they're scheduled on time to have graduation happen on time. So it seems like uh, many programs were able to get uh, normal clinical rotations or they scrambled to find other ones. You know, for example, myself, I was contacted by Midwestern and said, can you please take a pediatric rotation student? And this was kind of at the last minute and absolutely I'm glad to help. So we took that student in and got him in, got his cases and he's graduating in like the next few days, I think. So what, adjustments did we make as the American board during COVID-19? Well, on March 17th of last year, we sent a mass email to all CCPs that any recertification hardships faced by the current CCPs regarding clinical case or professional activity requirements due to the COVID-19 crisis will be handled on a case-by-case -case basis as needed. And the American board will grant the final extension at no fee to the end of the 2020 calendar year. So, uh, you know, one thing about uh, clinical cases, we've seen uh, during the pandemic that a lot of hospitals slow down. Uh, they were only doing emergent cases or they were told to absolutely close for a while. So it was hard getting cases for a while uh, for many perfusionists and we understand this. Um, also professional activity. I mean, COVID-19 turned meetings like this upside down. Uh, it's, I'm really kind of tired of presenting into a computer. I much prefer to be live and uh, avoid like some computer glitches that I've been seeing uh, pop up on my screen lately and uh, uh, speak live to everybody is a little bit better. So, you know, we've learned something along this process and that yes, you know, uh, CUs can be attained pretty easily uh, via staying at home and uh, doing video presentations. Uh, but, you know, we also miss the live clinical activities. But, you know, I'll tell you the truth, there are enough professional activities out there right now to get your CVUs. Um, it's just a lot of online learning. Uh, and hopefully uh, we'll be back to seeing each other in person pretty soon. Um, just a 2021 update, uh, the American Board waived the rule of only allowing one extension during a three-year recycle, three-year recertification cycle. Um, we used to have this, this rule that every three years with your recertification cycle, you can only have one extension. Well, we waive that now. We understand that this pandemic has lasted a lot longer than we all thought. And it's probably going to affect more of us uh, in this past year, uh, the beginning of 2021, uh, than anything. So we waive that rule. We also will continue to grant recertification extensions uh, when, when requested by the CCP. And don't forget the CCP has to formally request this with the American board. It cannot just say, eh, I'll just take care of it. Uh, you have to notify the American board about needing an extension and you will be granted that extension because of the pandemic. So let's look at some certification numbers and stats for this year. And this is all based on the annual report that was uh, presented to you at the end of last year. So numbers have changed a little bit. Uh, so far, as I mentioned before, we have 210 new, recertific new certifications. We had 110 people that were on extended leave at the end of last year. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a little bit. Um, we have we had 131 file for extension. We have a total of 4,522 4, perfusionists uh, to this date, and we lost only 94 perfusionists last year. So let's look a little bit more into these stats. 216 CCPs initially signed up for a recertification extension on August 1st, 2020. 131 CCPs were on extension at the end of the year. And typical year, we, we have an average number of around 94 CCPs uh, that file for an extension. So we had a slight uptick on this to be expected. In fact, I was kind of surprised it wasn't higher. Of these 131 
uh, CCPs, 67 CCPs were still unable to meet the requirements, uh, the deadline at the um, end of the year to file their cases, their 40 cases. Uh, these people were moved to conditional certification. So to this day, we have 174 CCPs that are on conditional certification. And in a typical year, uh, conditional certifications are about 99 CCPs a year. So it's a it's a pretty uh, dramatic uptick in this, and we'll have to keep on watching them and making sure people don't slip through the cracks. Um, however, some conditional certifications are destined to leave the field via retirement or other reasons. Um, and so, and others uh, might have life events and need to consider extended leave. Uh, for example, military duty, uh, having a baby, um, family issues. So, these people can, these CCPs can be on extended leave for this uh, moments of crisis or family changes. And please don't forget, extensions, conditional, and extended leave status is not punitive. The, the CCP is still American board certified during these periods. If you're on extension, you're still certified. If you're on extended leave, you're still certified. If you're on conditional, you're still certified. We stand behind you during these times. The American board does expect further hardships. Uh, in fact, I think they'll probably last another year or two uh, before we get a climb out of this and get back to normal. So the American board will uh, keep on studying everything and make adjustments as necessary. And don't forget every COVID related extension will be handled on a personal and case by case basis. Um, the American board were very proud of our national office and the outreach that they do. And if you pick up the phone and call them, you'll get a live happy person on the phone and willing to help you. And they are very informative. They're very knowledgeable. And you could always find a friendly voice on the phone if you call the national office with a, with a problem. In 2021, we did have 94 CCPs lose certification. On average, it's about 85 per year. And this is another, um, kind of stunning uh, number that I thought would be a lot higher last year. So again, uh, I think this recertification period, we're gonna have to watch a little bit closer. We'll probably have some more uh, that lose certification uh, because of the pandemic and life changes uh, because of the pandemic. Um, also, you know, the pandemic might be delaying life plans. Uh, retirement or CCPs uh, from leaving the field. So, you know, it seems like some people are just willing to stay put right now. Uh, recently, we had at my institution a job posting, and I, uh, we got maybe about 10 applicants, uh, 10 viable applicants, I should say. And um, I was surprised that we didn't get more. In a normal time when we did a search before for perfusionists, we got a lot more applicants. So, I, I think many people are just willing to stay put and uh, kind of ride out the pandemic or don't want to move their family around during a time of crisis. Uh, also, uh, we did hear some stories of, of perfusionists, uh, older perfusionists that were being guided to retirement uh, because of uh, COVID related decline in cases. So this is unfortunate uh, happenings because of the pandemic that some uh, programs and some uh, perfusion companies decided to, to kind of cull the herd a little bit and get rid of some of their older CCPs uh, because their case numbers were, were down. Uh, so we really feel for these uh, perfusionists that were impacted by this. Um, also uh, to note, there is an interesting article in the Chicago Tribune the other day or last fall that as COVID-19 surges, so do Illinois teacher retirement. So it seems like some professions have taken advantage of uh, this pandemic and kind of saw the writing on the wall and just said, I'm done and I'm gonna retire early. Um, uh, coincidentally, our hospital offered early retirement to a, a lot of employees this past year uh, to kind of ease the burden of COVID related uh, uh, financial impact on the hospital. So maybe uh, this year we'll definitely have to watch uh, more CCPs leaving the field. Let's look at the last 10 years of growth. As you can see, we've had steady CCP growth. So we are still retaining many CCPs and there's schools are still putting out good numbers of CCPs. 
So a little bit more in depth with this is a graph of uh, the green line is gains in CCPs and this is loss in CCPs, the red line. So you can see we, we do have a, a nice gap here. And a few years ago, uh, there was a lot of talk of, you know, we're going to get inundated with retirements and we're going to be uh, under. So it seems like we improved this gap a little bit. Um, however, I, I think we really need to watch these numbers more. And uh, I don't think we should overreact. I would hate to uh, flood the field and... Um, have the marketplace dry up and salaries dry up. Uh, however, I think we need to be cautious about um, ignoring this problem too. And in some areas and some centers, there is a shortage and we have to think about that and consider it. Uh, we really need uh, better data. And this uh, is an example of, of some of the data that we've collected and about retirement in 2016, our survey said about 38% will retire within the next 10 years. In 2017, the American board also uh, with the ACP committee did a survey and about 39% said they're gonna have retired, be gonna be retired within the next 10 years. Again, um, actual retirement dates may vary due to factors such as the economy, personal decision, and of course, a surprise pandemic. Um, also, our age force is aging. Uh, when we took this last survey, 29% of us are ages 50 to 59. 15.3 are 60 years and older. And I wouldn't, I was, I didn't show the stat, but there are perfusionists in their 70s still pumping cases. I mean, hats off to them. Uh, I just did an all nighter a night ago and it's hard to do. <laughs> it's just uh, getting older in this profession. It's just tougher and tougher and tougher. So my hat's off to them and keep on pumping. We are going to have another workforce survey this year when you uh, do your recertification. And this is a collaborative effort with the Academy of, of Cardiovascular Perfusion. Uh, we'll be lo looking at uh, recertification data. We'll also be looking at and asking you questions about how COVID-19 impacted your workforce and your, your working conditions. So when you recertify this year, please pay attention to your survey that is offered after you pay. Um, it's really vital information for us and it also impacts you. So please answer these questions in good faith. And past surveys are available at our website at ABC bp.org. So as you can see from our surveys, um, we can only tell attrition rates. Uh, we can only uh, analyze supply. We cannot analyze uh, complex marketplace demands. We cannot predict what's going to happen in the future. So this is going to require a lot more uh, involvement from the perfusion community itself. Uh, but you know, we can tell how many CCPs are coming in the door. We just can't tell what happens with them. And uh, we're gonna need other metrics uh, in combination with the American board data uh, to really study employee supply and demand. So this year, you're going to find some new things that we've been working on. We have uh, updated the online filing system. We are hoping to make this more streamlined, efficient and user-friendly. Uh, this new platform is multi-platform. You can use it on your phone, your tablet, uh, your computer. Um, we just uh, wanted to make it accessible to everybody and easy. You get done with the case, you pull out your phone. Hey, I'm going to put my case in right now. So it's easy to do. It is an ongoing, pro uh, ongoing project right now. And we're going to continue to listen to the Perfusion community to see what they want from an online filing system. And we will continue to improve it. In fact, uh, we are making an, an almost daily improvements to this new online filing system. Uh, we did have a few hiccups to begin with. Uh, first of all, the company that we hired is kind of a smaller IT company, and they were also impacted by the pandemic too. They had to release some of their employees because of the pandemic. They had to work from off site too. So there was a lot of, there was a period of shutdown for them and uh, a scrambling for them also. Um, don't forget, also, the American Board has been in existence for quite a long time. So 
to pull over all these files from all the perfusionists, all their clinical data, all their professional data, they transferred over 5 million files to the new online filing system. So this is quite a task. And what they found out there is many errors in the old system. Um, there's many like abbreviations. If you put ST instead of street, it didn't come over. There's lots of problems uh, with transfer of data over. So this took quite a time and uh, there was uh, significant hiccups with this. Um, however, this spring, we kind of did a soft launch of the online uh, filing system, the new online filing system, and we'll be having more online tutorials and people will be speaking about it at meetings just like I am right now to you. So uh, we're going to look into this a little bit more quickly. Just, uh, you know, just a sky view of, of this new application that we came up with. Uh, first of all, you have to update your IDs and your, your profile when you get in the new system. You will need to reset your password and please do not use your social security number. Our, our site is secure, however, you know that all the uh, hacking that's going on, so please do not. We've had many people use their secure, social security number in the past and we always encourage them not to do this, not a good idea. Um, you will update your personal profile on this page and you will also have to annually electronically sign uh, information authorization release uh, just in case you get audited and they will contact your supervisor at the hospital and to verify that yes you did do these cases and uh, american board ethical standard agreement uh, just one note too uh, <laughs> this happened about a month ago we realized that uh, this new system does is not compatible with internet explorer so if you're using Internet Explorer, like many hospitals use Internet Explorer, uh, please do not. Internet Explorer has a lot of issues and uh, should be steering away from it anyway. So this is a dashboard. This is basically your homepage. After you sign in and everything, you will go to your homepage. And one good thing about it is it's your main navigation page. You can actually see how many cases you filed already, your professional activity, uh, your account, your filing history. Uh, there's also instruction sheet and calendars too, where you can say, hey, did I go to that meeting? I can't remember the date. You can click on that and you can see a calendar of when those meetings were. It will tell you your cycle number here too. And uh, there's some more information up here, but I blurred it out because that's my personal information. Um, so also another good thing is there's a help button here too. So you can click on that help button. It will email the American board directly and you can state what your issue is and we will get back to you on that. Um, as far as payment too, we've increased our, our payment. I will show you payment screen pretty soon, but uh, it will store a credit card if you want to. And we also accept PayPal now, which is a, a kind of a big complaint from us before that we didn't do this before. Again, here's another look at the dashboard. So how do I enter a clinical case? Well, for my dashboard, I will hit add edit. And I will go to add new. And then first of all, I have to say which hospital I was at. So again, this automatically stores from a drop down list. The first time you enter it, yes, you'll have to manually type it in. After that, it'll automatically store. So if I put Lurie Children's, uh, if I click L, it should pop up. Everything should self-populate and you can move on. My designated authority will also pop up once I entered it. I will then enter my new clinical case. I will click the case date, the surgeon, and the case category. Um, I don't know if you remember uh, the old online filing system. We used to have type of case, you know, cabbage times one, times two, times three with the valve. Um, we no longer uh, require this. And the reason for this is that this data is basically junk data to us. Any perfusionist can enter any case they want to into the online filing system. You only need 40 cases. Uh, so you can put any 40 you, you want. Um, I told this story of when I first became a perfusionist that I would enter the 40 nastiest, toughest, longest cases I could just to impress the American board. Um, you know, so I would just go through my cases for the year. It's like, oh, that's a bad one. I'm putting that in there, you know, thinking, oh, it's going to impress somebody. 
they didn't look at it. <laughs> um, they just looked to make sure that you have 40 cases that are bona fide in your record. And well, maybe those tough cases did work because I am the president of the American board right now. So maybe in the long term, it did have a good effect, but honestly, it was junk data. What we really care about is what kind of category you're using to recertify. So if you're using cardiopulmonary bypass cases, ECMO cases, VADs, you know, combination of uh, standbys, um, ex vivo cases. So that's, we're more interested in the type of cases that you're doing than the actual clinical case that you're doing. So after this, um, you will click submit, surgeon will be saved and you'll move on. So how do I enter professional activity? Well, basically the same way you will click add edit. You will say, I'm gonna add a new professional activity. You go to the category. Again, there's a drop down list of categories, and I'm sorry I don't have it on the slide. You will pick and choose. If you are an author uh, for a journal, you can use that as a CEU. If you are a clinical affiliate, you get, a, you get three CEUs per year for this. So um, it's, a, it's a good way to just click it and go. You will just, uh, say what kind of meeting it was or type of CEU event it was, the date, the sponsor, and location and you will click uh, submit. So how do I submit my activity to the American board? So when you're all done entering all your cases, again, clinical activity, 40 cases are required, 45 CEUs are required. You have a running tally on your dashboard. Once you're done, you can see, you can just submit it to the American board via the submit button. I think we are changing the submit button to file and pay because it is confusing to some people that are using this uh, new online filing system, what submit. They think it's like the daily submit of a clinical case. So we are clarifying this button a little bit more now. However, it will take you to your summary. All your information, personal information will come up in this blank area. I left it blank for obvious reasons because it's mine. And then it will take you to your payment page and it will show you your fees. Uh, your recertification fees, and uh, if you had to pay any additional fees uh, for that year. You will then click submit, and you will get a verification that you submitted everything. You could always go back and look to see in your history when you submitted it, and it'll have a full record of all your submissions throughout the years. So what's next for the online filing system? So earlier I mentioned to you that we're gonna listen to you. We're gonna to listen to what you say about the new online filing system, see what works, what doesn't, what can be improved. And again, this is a work in progress. This is something we're really invested in in technology for the future. So one thing we're thinking about too is having professional activity, um, your record of professional activity recorded via a QR code. So for example, if I signed up for the Texas Heart meeting, we would assign a QR code for the Texas Heart meeting. And once you registered, you would get that QR code, you click on it in your phone and it automatically download into your online filing system. So this is that's something that we're really looking into for the future. And I'm hoping that will come up in the next year or two where it will make it so much easier for you, for you and for the uh, administrators of uh, these meetings to do this. Uh, we are also working on app-based communications from the American board. So um, along with our online filing system, uh, have surveys or information or communications from the American board go directly to your phone. Uh, we're also thinking about having a storage system too. So you can uh, show your employer or anybody interested your certificate and your license uh, automatically on your phone. And uh, please tell us what you think about it. Again, it's a work in progress. Uh, you. But please, please be patient with this. Uh, it is uh, quite a task and uh, it, it doesn't, uh, everything doesn't go as smoothly as planned uh, as you can expect with life. <laughs> so what else has the American board been up to? Well, we were active in our subcommittees too to investigate, address and collaborate with other organizations in an ever-changing profession. 
Perfusion isn't static, it is changing all the time and pretty fast. So we've developed a subcommittee of ECMO VAD and new technology to keep ahead of all this and how to implement it into the exam process and the recertification process also. Um, this past pandemic has taught us we need a subcommittee to look more into the COVID-19 pandemic and how it affects the perfusionists and our students. Uh, so right now, if you have a problem uh, with your clinical cases or anything, and you email the national office and say, hey, I got a problem with the, I can't make my recertification this year, it automatically goes to the subcommittee um, for evaluation. And again, everything is handled on a case by case basis. We don't make blanket statements for everybody. Uh, we like to be personable and uh, work with everybody on the pandemic and any problems they may have. Uh, another uh, progress is ex vivo organ perfusion is now considered a primary clinical case. And uh, see the book of information for more information on the requirements of ex vivo organ uh, perfusion. But we've heard from a lot of centers that this should be because it takes up a vast majority of time, requires a lot of skill and basic perfusion maneuvers. Uh, so we agreed with this and is now a, a primary clinical case. Um, excuse me, um, exam de development. We are focusing on adding more ECMO and VAD questions. We are fortifying and updating pediatric questions. Um, technology changes, uh, techniques changes. So we really need to go back and update a lot of uh, uh, questions. Um, we added many new PDSC and CAPE questions to the exam recently too. It is ever changing and ever growing. Uh, we also are working with simulation centers uh, to uh, 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 accept their criteria for clinical cases. We have 12 simulation centers throughout the United States that met the criteria to be recognized as a simulation center. As I said, these uh, centers can be used for clinical case credit. Uh, simulated cases can be used as a secondary credit for up to 15 per year. Uh, basically a secondary event. So see the American Board website for more details on this information. Another great thing that we did this last thing was uh, the last few years is having emeritus CCPs and honoring CCPs that have a 20 plus years of dedicated service that are retiring. Uh, we currently have 655 CCP emeritus out there. It was a great honor uh, to recognize these people who have served the community for so long. Um, in addition, we've added a memorandum section uh, to remember the CCPs who have passed on. Again, you know, just looking at this list too, you can just pick out people that you know, or, or you know, even if you don't know them very well, you saw at a meeting and you had a good time with them and shared a laugh with them. It's, it's good to remember these people that came before us. And we should have some more news coming out this summer or later this fall about more advancements in the American board uh, processes. Again, I would like to remind you that the American Board will constantly monitor the COVID-19 crisis and effects on our profession, our educational system, and the individual CCP. The American Board will adapt to make any necessary certification changes during this difficult time. It's been a tough year for all of us, and the CCPs have continued to advance despite adversity in the uh, COVID pandemic. And can't uh, thank you enough for all your dedication to the profession and staying with each other during this time of crisis. Thank you. And please stay safe out there. I will take any questions. Thank you.